the introduction and hello everyone. Um, happy to be with you here presenting some uh, things about uh, the music and sound practitioners program at the Open Center that I will be leading. Um, I will tell you about um, the curriculum and the changes um, I've made and um, the various presenters who will be teaching. Um, and um, some things about uh, the classes that I'll be teaching, some more detailed information, because I've been receiving uh, emails and inquiries from people who are interested in this program. And uh, later on, I will show you some of the scientific studies that I've been doing on sound, which I will be addressing uh, during the courses. So I'm going to switch to the PDF. <coughs> um, these are the presenters who would be involved in teaching the various courses um, during the program. Um, all the courses would be happening either over the weekend, one day long uh, course or two day long courses, um, and uh, Friday evenings uh, for the most part. So we have Isai Barnwell who would be teaching about the voice, very important uh, aspects of um, sound therapy, we, we will have two practitioners who will be addressing the voice in greatest amount of detail. Um, Sylvia Nakash is the, the next presenter as well, but I'll also be addressing various things in, in my own way uh, during a certain course. We also have uh, John Beaulieu, many of you know John Beaulieu and his uh, scientific research on tuning forks and frequencies, um, so he will be teaching a weekend. Thomas Amelio, the president and CEO of the Open Center, would be talking about a mantra, the voice, and sound meditation as well. And uh, Jeff Falk and Gabrielle Kellerman. We're very happy to have Gabrielle Kellerman, who's uh, a cybatics expert. He's an artist, art historian, and a researcher who's done tremendous amount of work on cymatics. If uh, some of you are not familiar with what cymatics are, cymatics are the visible manifestation of sound. Sound can move matter, whether that matter is powder, salt, sand, water, liquids, um, and it can have a specific image. Every frequency can have a specific image, but all depending on many variables, um, which I may not mention right now because it's very convoluted. So why is it important to know about cymatics? Because it's really a very important aspect of sound. It's the hidden dimension of sound. We only experience the auditory, but we are not aware how much our bodies react to sound. As we all know, the body receives sound as well, but because of the auditory aspect is far greater than the physical aspect, we think it's only auditory. You know, the body, everything inside the body, the liquid and, and the, the molecules are impacted by sound. So uh, Gabrielle is uh, traveling from Romania to be with us uh, for a few days and he will be teaching an all day long program at the Open Center. Uh, next we have Nacho Arimani who is a wonderful percussionist and vocalist and he's multi-instrumentalist, not just percussionist, but he would be teaching um, a lot about the use of percussion instruments in um, sound therapy. We also have Joshua Leeds who would be teaching um, psychoacoustics, a very important aspect of understanding how sound works and it's the, the, the aspect of um, acoustics which is a branch in physics that deals with um, the behavior of sound uh, and frequencies and myself. So the changes that I made in the program and the things that I've included is more scientific research, more research based on actual uh, field work with uh, various people, various traditions throughout the world, uh, field work that I've done in over 40 countries uh, in the past years, collecting data from um, shamanic societies, uh, data from uh, people who practice holistic practices in Eastern philosophies, mantras and sutra chant systems, um, 
and so on. So as an ethnomusicologist, I thought that this would be tremendously valuable uh, data to include in, in such a course, such a program, to better understand how sound has been used throughout the world as a tool to affect human consciousness. So uh, the next slide, um, here are the titles the courses that I'll be teaching, and I'll address each one of them, uh, one by one, with the details. Uh, the first one that I'll be teaching is about sound theory. It's over a weekend, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. In this weekend course, participants will learn about basic theory of Western music for non-musicians, sound theory, the importance of the harmonic overtone series, microtonality, the concept of ethos, the principles of and philosophy of working with sound, the theory of playing and its technique, and basic physics of sound in a comprehensible way. You will also learn about the importance of using the voice of both the practitioner and the receiver through toning and vocalization. Students will get to do a practicum on various instruments, including the voice. Practical information and tips will be given on what kinds of instruments are used in sound therapy and how to select them. So, uh, yes, this information will be uh, packaged and targeted to non-musicians. I know there will be some musicians in the course, but I'm not going to deal with technical things that only musicians would understand, uh, which wouldn't be fair because a lot of people who work with sound, uh, people who have not majored in music, have not played an instrument, can't read music. So I will be addressing uh, basic and important things that anyone can understand. They, will, they may still bring uh, something new to those who know music theory because, again, this is about music theory as it is helpful for sound practitioners. Same things with physics, uh, acoustics, and uh, other technical aspects that are connected to sound therapy. Overtone series, microtonality, the concept of ethos. So harmonic overtone series, sometimes they're called harmonics, or sometimes overtones, they're used interchangeably, um, is the most important thing in sound. It's basically the mathematical aspect of sound. It's the physical aspect of, of uh, sound, uh, the physics, I mean, in terms of physics. So really understanding what sound is and why it is the way it does and why the tone color of one specific instrument is different from another. I will address this in detail a little later. So the ethos is uh, the distinguishing character, the personality, the spirit of sound, if you will. Um, for example, if you're listening to a piece of music written in a key, um, in some major key, C major, G major, um, it's going to sound differently than a piece of music written in a minor key. While a major key may sound happy, lighthearted, easygoing to most or all people, the minor key would sound sad, uh, has a sense of lament and nostalgia, it's a sense of yearning to others. So this is the ethos. The ethos at one point in time was the most important thing in music, that we kind of um, lost it in the West. We have much less emphasis put on it, whereas ancient musical, musical cultures that continue to exist um, still value very much the ethos. For example, if you're listening to Indian classical music, um, musicians would be using raga, or raga is a mode similar to a scale. Every scale or mode has distinguish, distinguishing character personality based on the intervals that are in the scale, the intervals that are between the notes. It's very important to mention here that what's important in scale is not just the notes, but rather the intervals, the distance between one note and another. This is really what impacts us in a specific way and um, allow the scale, the mode, the raga, the makam, to evoke specific emotions in us. So I will be talking thoroughly about this aspect, which is probably one of the most important thing in the way we experience sound. And um, so some um, various things will also be addressed, the toning, vocalization, um, how I uh, advise using the voice. Um, and also we will have a lot of um, 
a chance to practice on various instruments. Uh, you don't need to bring your instruments. You can if you'd like. Um, I will be bringing my instruments and uh, my assistant as well uh, will be bringing his. So this is about the first course. The second course, Transcendental and Psychedelic States of Sound. Why am I including psychedelic in here? Because literally the, the, the etymology of the word in ancient Greek means manifesting the mind. Um, manifesting the mind happens in a wide variety of different ways and not just when one takes uh, an entheogen plant teacher in a shamanic ceremony, uh, but when we're meditating, when we're working with sound, this uh, manifestation of the mind, the revealing of the mind, is a very important tool to understand what consciousness is. In order for us to understand what our consciousness is, all the different shades of different types of consciousness we experience, and remember it's not always the same, it depends on whether we're sleeping, we're awake, we're angry, we're happy, we're in love, uh, we had coffee or alcohol and so on. So these are all different psychedelic states, states of mind, where often chemicals that we ingest that are, or that are secreted, certain practices, yoga, meditation, or certain things we ingest uh, can affect the state. Um, so it's very important to understand that sound uh, alters our state because it does a variety of things to our um, autonomic nervous system, to the vagus nerve, I'll mention these things later, to the brainwave cycles. So it affects us in, in more ways than one. And it's important to understand how sound really affects us and why. So I'll be talking about the value of uh, uh, phenomenological study uh, of an experience and how does it facilitate, uh, here I'm reading the description, uh, how does it facilitate a better understanding of the transcendental psychedelic state of sound? Learn how to listen more judiciously, attentively, and equanimously to sound. Uh, exercise psychonautic skills to navigate in sound. Psychonautic, if you're not familiar with this word, is becoming the astronaut of the psyche. It's what happens when we're meditating or different uh, situations. Um, and to pay attention on a deeper level. We'll also discuss the value and the skill of developing an appropriate and fine-tuned language to describe the experience. Language is an essential component of consciousness. The cl this class will also include a short performance as a part of the presentation. It's very important for us to become aware of how sound affects us and what happens within us and what kind of tools we can use to enhance the way sound work on us. I, after all the research that I've done, the personal experiences, the scientific studies, and the field work that I've done in my years of education, 12 years of education doing four different degrees in music, um, i absolutely positive and sure that sound does not heal us in some sort of miracle. Sound can affect the physical body, but most of its power is based on the awareness of the receiver. This is why I often promote to people to be uh, active participants, to give attention to sound, to watch what's happening in their mind as they're receiving an experience and not just being uh, sitting in front of the instruments uh, as I'm playing or someone else, a sound therapist, and uh, the mind is wandering and they're receiving. This actually does not get so far the person receiving needs to listen judiciously and attentively in a meditative way and to learn how to navigate with the sound of a gong of a singing bowl or whatever instruments being used to quiet the mind and by quieting the mind one gives way to what the sound can do to the brain to the heart to the autonom autonomic nervous system to everything in, in ourself. So it's very important to um, gain a deeper and, and more educated way to how to learn with sound. And these things are not obvious, not, not at all. We all listen differently based on how much we know about the subject that we are addressing. Um, 
what is happening in our mind. As you all know, you know, we have our favorite styles and genres of music, and there are other genres that we avoid, and some we don't listen to at all, some we dislike. So the ones that we like are the ones we connect to, the ones that we know the band, we know the artists, we know what's happening, we can understand the style, whether that style is classical jazz and rock and pop and so on. But a lot of people, for example, uh, they tell me that they, they don't like jazz because they don't know how to listen to it, they can't connect to it. Jazz is one of these musical styles, among many, where one would gain a deeper level of appreciation, enjoyment, and understanding by knowing how it works, knowing about the form, the role of the instrument, um, what improvisation is and how it works, so on and so forth. There, were, there are many aspects to address here. So naturally, if, uh, if we know how to listen to jazz, we're going to enjoy it more. Similar, similarly, when we listen to musical instruments uh, that are used in sound therapy, we need to know how to listen to it, to have certain awareness and the presence and uh, a quiet of the mind. So this is why this uh, course is immensely important. Uh, the next core that I'll be giving is sound the medicine of the future. This workshop will inform you of the latest applications of sound in the medical field as an effective tool in holistic practices and as a weapon, unfortunately. You know, as you may know, anything you can do good with, you can do bad with. And uh, we've seen a lot of research in the past years, and they're increasing, of uh, various applications of sound um, and, and its therapeutic effects on the body. It's mostly um, engineered sound, ultrasound, and not just normal instruments, although these can have therapeutic properties. Um, also will be addressed are <clears throat> the psychological benefits of working with sound using data acquired from hundreds of participants over several years of practice. Here I'm mentioning the people that I've worked with and uh, from whom I collected data, my observations, and <clears throat> also um, experience sharing that they, they sent me in form of email or in verbal form. And I have amassed hundreds of these emails, literally hundreds, and in most uh, extensive uh, ones in length as well, all emails that I've ever received. The next course, the practitioner and the receiver in Soundboard, Saturday, January 23rd. This class will focus on the psychological aspects of the practitioner and of the receiver during a sound therapy session to provide a genuine and empowering support and to nurture and promote the inherent self-healing capacity in the receiver. This includes how to promote an active participation through educating and engaging the receiver in the experience, how to be in service, to exhibit care, to support, and to connect with him or her on a compassionate and empathetic level. When and how to introduce cognitive therapy to allow the participant to express his or her feelings and emotions. The attitude and the demeanor of the practitioner will be thoroughly addressed as well as the problem of ego inflation along with the detriment of false beliefs regarding how sound therapy works. This, once again, is one of the new things that I will be introducing to this program um, <clears throat> that I rarely see being addressed in sound therapy. Um, as we all know, this practice is becoming more and more popular and desired, and a lot of people are becoming more and more curious in understanding how sound works, how to work with sound as a practitioner or as a receiver. But uh, unfortunately, like so many things, when we don't know how uh, something works, connected to the mechanics, to the science, to whatever is involved, in order for us to be informed on a greater level, human beings everywhere in the world would end up by conjuring up some explanation as to what seems to be happening. And unfortunately, this is happening a lot these days, and I've witnessed it so much as a receiver or as a person observing people 
working with sound or talking about sound and uh, you know there are a lot of workshops that may be had over a day or a couple of days or a week sound is incredibly complex there are so so many things to understand about it i can tell you this as a fact and basically uh, after 12 years of education in music i thought i knew some things about sound and music when i started this independent study nine years ago i realized that um, i actually don't know the most important things uh, which was um, concerning but also exciting because i've been learning so much from the research from the field work that i've done as to continue from working with people how people perceive sound how what affects them and how and really gaining a deeper understanding but there's so much to know to summarize it there's so so much to know but the hard thing is that it's hard to know what we don't know simply and it's hard to imagine how things would be different when we get to know that which we don't know and we're not aware of it's a little bit philosophical here but that's the best way i can express it i'm sure you can relate to this is something we experience in just about any subject let alone something of magnitude with the magnitude of, of sound and it's something uh, that affects us on the most fundamental way why people love music it's a mystery right so we can understand some things by using science using a multidisciplinary approach and that's the approach that i've been taking in, in to better understand why sound works and how uh, and that is basically using all of the tools uh, at, that are at our disposal um, basically uh, knowledge for music physics acoustics specifically um, psychology neuroscience what the brain goes through when we're listening to sound and i'll show you some uh, snapshots of scans later on um, what the vagus nerve goes through how the heart rate variability changes uh, certain aspects from um, philosophy like phenomenology the term that you saw a little earlier uh, which is uh, the study of a structure of an experience an experience can be had in many different ways and on many different levels it depends on the presence the attention of the observer and that's something that i would be addressing so multidisciplinary ap approach is immensely important in, our, in order for us to really understand um, how much is there to understand to benefit from and what kind of tools we need to use to enhance our understanding as practitioners to be educated informed so that we'll be able to help people on a deeper level this is important it's becoming more and more important to demystify a lot of the hooey and hokey things and unconfirmed rumors and wishful thinking wishful believing that i'm starting to see more and more uh, being circulated on the internet or individuals related to sound now i totally understand that people come from a good place it is their passion and their desire to really want to understand something as mystical as powerful as sound but we have to understand the pitfalls that we have in the process the pitfalls that we may encounter when uh, this passion is not addressed in a level-headed way uh, and and when we're not informed as much as we should be um, and when we're not using a multidisciplinary approach to better understand this powerful tool to understand it to work with it to transmit it and teach others so this is very very important and we shouldn't let our passion lead us to gullibility in to eventually buy into just about anything that is being circulated and there are a lot of non-confirmed rumors on the internet i'm not gonna go over them but people are getting into all sorts of things that are not being confirmed so it's important for us to take this very very seriously and not uh, mislead ourselves and 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 mislead others so this is a very important aspect to address here but another uh, aspect that i will be addressing is the ego inflation aspect which is something that happens a lot when we deal with these powerful practices 
whether these practices are meditation, yoga, all sorts of holistic practices, um, shamanic work, uh, working with sound, the ego is the hardest thing to deal with. And very often, the ego inflates without our awareness. Because we're dealing with powerful tools such as sound, and when we don't understand where this power comes from, sometimes we have the tendency to capitalize on the power of sound. And by doing so, we rub the, uh, the, the pra- participants, um, his or her experience. And self-empowerment is a huge part of healing and therapy. So there is also a tendency for people who are not trained as much as they should be, don't have this awareness. This can happen. Now, please remember that I'm saying this with all compassion and empathy and understanding. And that is a big problem. Ego inflation is a big problem to all gurus, to all teachers, to all shamans, to all um, healers and practitioners. So it's very important to address to greatest level to create self-awareness and understanding coming from a good place. Um, So the next course, um, shamanism as a sound tool. And this class will focus on the various methods and techniques that shamanic societies have used sound as a tool to achieve non-ordinary states of consciousness. This the discussion will also include the use of sound with different sacraments, which often consisted of psychedelic plants, the ways these two elements potentiate each other, the rhetoric and the narrative about the experience and its value in various shamanic models, the danger and problems involved in taking them out of context, and the importance of construction of the shamanic set and setting. Media examples will be played accompanied by an ethnomusicological study of how certain ancient musical cultures, melodic and rhythmic modes and harmonic systems are built to make use of the inherent therapeutic potential of sound and to expand and reveal human consciousness. This is a very important course that would last an entire day um, in which I would address the various ways shamanic societies Um, have used sound, of course, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, I'll cover some important ones, Um, and to learn about how sound is a tool. All of these are tools. Plants are tools. Meditation is a tool. Sound is a tool to get to know the self, to connect to the higher self, to the awakened self, to the spirit world, and use various words. So, um, to understand how sound's been used in shamanism, um, by basically uh, uh, doing case studies and showing you case studies and talking about various examples, but I'll also be talking about how certain musical cultures, ancient musical cultures, have used sound in their harmonic systems almost in a shamanic way. One can even have the freedom of saying shamanic way, really. When we talk about shamanic here, it's basically... Um, uh, explaining ways of um, addressing ways that the ancients, tribal societies, various tribal societies throughout the world, shamanism is found uh, throughout the world in all different cultures and not just in the Amazon. And uh, so these are the topics that will be addressed in in this course. Um, The next course, how to facilitate the sound meditation. Uh, During this weekend, course, you will learn how to facilitate a sound meditation, which is an integrated practice that I have created that combines a shamanic ceremonial setting with an Eastern emphasis on breathing exercises and visualization. Specific musical instruments played during the meditation allow participants to use sound as a therapeutic tool to disconnect from discursive thinking and delve into transcendental state. The goal is to enable participants to disengage their undesirable habitual patterns and to empower positive cognitive change. The sound meditation is a setting that allows a participant to experience through sound an inner stillness and peace beyond the interference of the mind. 
the workshop will include a thorough explanation of the sound meditation elements, a direct experience of sound meditation, a discussion about the experience, and a coaching in how to facilitate it. The elements of the sound meditation are intentions, setting, meditation, breathing exercises, judicious listening, visualization, and guided visualization, verbal guidance to bring awareness over to an emitting instrument, and toning and vocalization. Excuse me. <coughs> so, um, this is a, an integrated experience that I put together based on my research, um, my field work, my understanding of how sound works, but also based on all the work that I've done with people. And this is something that keeps on growing and keeps on being improved. And um, so as you see here that I'm not just using sound, sound is the most important tool, but I also work with, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> I had a cold last week and still hasn't completely gone away. Um, so, um, so using various tools to enhance uh, the work of sound, um, to enhance what sound can do for us, to learn to pay attention on a greater level and to potentiate the therapeutic power of sound. So that's uh, what this class will cover. I'd like to mention also that we have at the end a 30 minutes of Q&A. If you have a question, please write it down. and. Um, uh, you can either go directly online and ask it, or you can give it to Pete. Uh, there's also Anne-Marie Cushing uh, online. She's a wonderful person, extremely knowledgeable, who will be dealing with the administrati administrative side of uh, this program. So if you have any questions, she would be happy to answer her questions uh, later on. So now what I'm going to play is a short video. Um, I used the software to analyze the harmonic overtones of a specific ball. Um, harmonic overtones are various frequencies that are involved in any sound that we hear. These frequencies um, give the sound of the instrument, of the human voice, or any sound that we hear um, in nature or human-made instruments. Uh, they're found there to give the sound its tone color, its timbre, which would allow you to differentiate, say, the sound of a guitar from the sound of a violin. Um, there are overtones. You'll see them here in this video um, as lines. You see two groups of lines, an upper and lower. These are actually two channels, left channel, right channel, of the same Himalayan singing wall. Um, and each horizontal line is one harmonic. When I play the video, you will hear the sound of the bowl, all the harmonics emerging simultaneously, and then you will hear each one individually, one by one, and then at the end you'll hear the entire sound as you would hear it when striking the bowl. So it's important to understand the harmonic overtones, to even see them, to connect what we hear with what we see, to gain a deeper understanding. Harmonic overtones are something that I cover a lot and, and talk about to greatest level of de detail to demystify a certain very, very important aspect of sound. Okay, and here we go. Yeah, fascinating, isn't it? Um, so this can be done on any instrument. And various instruments uh, may have more than six or seven overtones. May have, uh, I've seen hundreds. Gong, for example, or Shruti box can easily go up to 50, 100, depending on uh, the diameter of the gong. Um, some can have less. but. Uh, the importance of the harmonic overtone is tremendous because um, 
as you probably know, that uh, almost all instruments used in uh, sound therapy are instruments that emit harmonic overtones to clearly audible level. If you were to analyze the sound of a note on a guitar plucked, when you pluck it, you don't hear these overtones when they're actually there, but they're being overshadowed, masked, if you will, by the fundamental frequency, which is the most pronounced note that you hear. But when you play, um, so yeah, if you were to analyze the sound of a note played on a guitar, you doing harmonic spectrum such as this one, you can actually um, see them that they are there, but the fundamental frequency would be much greater, so you wouldn't be able to notice the overtones. Whereas when you play a gong, Himalayan singing bowl, tuning fork, the jiridu, uh, shruti box, all these instruments where you can actually hear the overtones, you can actually see them. And human beings have always gravitated toward overtones, constructing instruments. Um, you, that emit overtones, even when using plant material, which is a very hard thing to, to do. Normally, these overtones would emerge in an easier way when the instrument is made out of metallurgy, the alloy of different metals, and so on. And, and this is why we use these instruments primarily when we work with sound, sound therapists, sound healers. Uh, it's, there must be something in it, and I'll talk about all this stuff in the class cover. This, for example, is the harmonic spectrum of Shruti box. One note. Notice how many there are. Next one is Native American Indian flute. Uh, these squiggles and the descending pattern you see basically is a little trill as I'm playing and descending to a lower note and eventually ascending. Now, notice the difference between this and classical transverse flute. It's the classical flute, the server flute, that's used in classical music. Much less overtones. Notice once again, I'm going to go back to the native Indian. A lot of very clearly visible overtones. And here. This doesn't mean that the flute cannot be played in sound healing. It can. It depends on what you're doing with it. But preferably, it's better to use instruments that have a wide spectrum of overtones. It'll take me a long time to tell you why and how they work and so on. This is what I'm going to be addressing in the class. Um, so this is another spectrum um, of a gong. This is 32-inch symphonic gong played with a mallet, that Paiste symphonic gong. This specific one is, is made by Paiste, uh, a company that makes gong. They also make mallets. Uh, and they come with different mallets. You can buy different mallets. You probably have seen gong gong players using different mallets that may have different sizes, different weight, different amount of padding or hardness. So M4 is one in the middle. Um, and when you play the gong, a uh, lot of overtones emerge. And this is, you, you may see it as a tiny image, but you can actually zoom into it so that it'll be as big as, uh, say, the Shruti box image that you saw earlier. So when you play with an M4 mallet, it brings out different overtones. This is why gong players use different mallets. I have many different mallets that when I'm playing my gongs, I use them to bring out different sides of the spectrum of the overtones. This is a common practice. I wanted to understand why the sound will be different and how it looks when it's different. And this is something that I address with my students so that they really understand how to use these mallets, how to play gongs, how to play them in the most efficient way and work with them. So I will be teaching various instruments, in case you're wondering. Um, and um, I will be teaching the most essential instruments I use in, in sound therapy. Um, and uh, so this is how it looks like when we're using the M4. And the next slide will be using M6, a bigger, thicker padding get it for a second and I'm gonna go back M4 and the M6 these vertical lines that you see these are actually the mallet hits on the gong so just to summarize it for you because it will take a tremendous amount of time to tell you all the detail when we use basically a bigger 
mallet that has more padding, that is not very hard, that's heavier, it tends to bring out the lower overtones and giving you a massive bassy uh, sound because it's bringing out, releasing the lower overtones on the gong, whereas when you play something that's lighter, harder, not as padded, um, and of course, there are many variables. It depends on where on the gong you play, how much force you put into it, and so on. It's not as simple as it may sound. Um, so a, a lighter, uh, less padded method would bring out the higher overtones. And the most correct way of playing on the gongs, if you're playing just one gong, um, is to explore the potential of what this gong can do. Explore the probability, and you'll be able to bring out different clusters of overtones. And another aspect that's important is how to listen to it again, which is something that I share with people I work with, and that's something that I will be addressing in another course, as I said earlier. Um, how to pay attention, how to use sound as a tool to stop the discursive thinking. So a gong player would end up by painting different emotions, different colors, different overtones, uh, that can evoke different emotion, allowing the person to efficiently use sound as a tool to quiet the mind and to journey to use psychonautic skills. So all these things um, I'll be addressing, things that I learned about through the scientific work that I've done. The next thing I'm going to mention is some of the um, scientific studies that I've done with EEG, brainwave cycles, these are uh, cycles that our brain goes through depending on uh, various things that we do in the, during the day or night. Delta state is when our brain is operating on 0 0.1 to 4 hertz. It's a deeply asleep and not dreaming. Theta state, 4 to 8 hertz, meditative, drowsy, and drifting down into sleep and dreams. Alpha state, 8 to 13 hertz, awake but mentally relaxed. Beta state 12 to 30 hertz, alert, busy, concentrating, and engaged in activities. Gamma state 30 to 100 hertz, hyper brain activity, which is great for learning and creating. So, um, some of the EEG scans uh, will follow next. Electroencephalography, that's what EEG stands for, in case you're not familiar with it. This, for example, here, you're looking at my subject's brain, um, and the depth is time, which is about six seconds. The horizontal line that you see on the bottom is where the brainwave cycles are. Basically, this portion that you see on the left is the left hemisphere, the portion you see on the right is the right hemisphere. And it goes, the brainwave cycles go from zero, 20 to 20 and 60 and so on, going higher and higher. Uh, the blue color uh, signals no electrical activity. Uh, the green color, tiny more electrical activity. And then you have red, a little higher electrical activity, um, yellow, and then white. So one can say that this is a busy mind. There are a lot of sharp peaks, a lot of activity is happening here. Even though the person is laying down, wearing a mask, and not listening to anything. But as you know, the mind is always at work. That's why uh, in Buddhism it's called the monkey mind. So, um, and everything is measured using microvolts. You'll see them in the middle between the two sections, zero micro V, microvolt, 10 microvolt, and so on. Um, a microvolt is approximately one millionth of a volt. So everything that happens in our brain is based on electrical activity and chemicals. So I play large gong, loud dynamics. After two minutes, the activity flattens. You'll see that there's only blue and some greens and just a little tiny eruption in the left side and left hemisphere. You see it there again. I'm going to show you the previous one. And then the one with the gong. So various instruments can induce different effects in the brain. This is a fifth played on tuning fork. Fifth is a very powerful interval. You can get a fifth if you play C and G together or D and A and so on. So you see here also very quiet mind across the board.
with just a tiny bit of activity in both hemisphere um, around the theta in early alpha state. If you look on the bottom theta and alpha, you can figure out where this is happening. Um, next, small Vietnamese gong that I use also has great effect, quieting the mind. Small Japanese bell, loud dynamics, quiets the mind very, very much. Now, notice the difference here between the loud dynamics and the soft dynamics. This huge eruption that you see mostly in the left hemisphere. This is not discursive thinking. This, these are not thoughts. This is actually the limbic, limbic system. The limbic system is where our emotions are. Emotions are affected very much by sound and music we listen to. The ethos specifically, as you remember, I talked earlier about uh, what ethos does when it comes to sound, how it can evoke emotions. So what is healing, one of the things why sound can heal, can induce therapy, because it allows us to experience different emotional state by evoking new emotions, revibrating everything, shaking off the flakes, and being able to let go of all the walls, the emotional walls, all the stiffness, all the hardness, all uh, that can be induced by all the issues that we've been dealing with, uh, stress, problems, and, and so on. Sound revibrates that, it brings everything into aliveness. This is what the limbic system does. It's that there are new emotions being um, introduced here to the self, almost uh, allowing the body to heal itself. Huh? That's a very important thing I can talk about for a long time, how really the healer, this is why I don't use the term uh, sound healer. I'm not a sound healer. Um, I, my definition of a healer is someone who helps people heal themselves. So the the receiver, the active participant, is the healer. And I'd, I avoid using the word sound healing in general because, uh, especially with what's happening these days, you know, there are a lot of gimmicks out there. It's being sold as a tool. I don't use it, although healing can happen and therapy can happen, um, but it's not as uh, magical, as, as easy as it may seem. It's very complex. There are many things involved. The active participants' awareness, knowledge, um, prerequisite knowledge for knowing how to work with sound, and, and the practitioners' uh, understanding how these instruments can induce therapy. Um, healing is not something that is going to happen just like that by sitting in front of gong and closing my eyes and, and not paying attention to my mind. So it's, it's a charged term when you say sound healing. There's a lot happening. So. It, it takes, uh, uh, I'm being here careful, attentive, judicious, and this is why I don't favor sound healing as a, as a term, because of all the research that I've done and all the things now that I know that I didn't know before, which made me understand how sound heals. At the end, yes, it heals, but it's not just by magic. It's not by taking it lightly. It's by really using it as a tool and promoting its use on both sides, the side of the practitioner and the side of the receiver who needs to be empowered by being allowed to own the experience and not to think that the practitioner healed him or her with sound, without their awareness, without their participation. This is what I'm aiming for is um, the, the self-empowerment, the understanding, as best as we can. We don't understand everything about sound. Even with science, we don't have all the tools that we need to understand everything we can. Things are improving, yes, but not everything is mystical about sound. There are a lot of things that we do understand. We may not be aware of, we may not address, we may not be using multidisciplinary approach to really understand there are things that we can understand, but there are things we know and things that we don't know. And we hope for the best. So this is a frame drum. Frame drums, all instruments with skin, animal skin or, or synthetic skin, have overtones. It's not a very pronounced um, spectrum. It's decent. Now, what's powerful here with this frame drum effect on the, on the brain is that you see the synchrony 
things are quite similar from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. Things change if you play specific rhythms. Here, what I was playing is just a steady beat, boom, 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 uh, and not playing a groove or rhythmic mode. So things become very difficult to understand, complex and rich and fascinating when you introduce rhythms. As you know, a lot of uh, almost all mu ancient musical cultures, even ones continuing to exist, such as Indian classical music, um, Armenian, Central Asian, Persian, Turkish, Arabic, North African, basically all ancient musical cultures. And Western musical culture is considered to be new because of uh, the, the continuing development of music and harmonic system. Um, harmonic system that we use in the West, which we call tertial harmony, based on stacking up thirds, interval of thirds, uh, started developing in the 11th and 12th century. So not so long ago compared to ancient musical culture. And still it, it, uh, underwent a few centuries of development, which is keep on changing, it keeps on changing. But we changed so many things that ancient musical systems had, we don't have. Uh, one of them is the way we use harmony, uh, the harmonic system, the chordal system, the tertial harmony. This you don't find in um, indigenous music or ancient classical harmonic systems. You would find it in, in uh, other non-Western countries only because uh, of pop, the influence of pop and rock. Um, but when it comes to traditional music, you don't find chordal accompaniment in the same way you find in the West. Also, another thing that we did is introducing the equal temperament, which is the act of dividing the octave into 12 equidistant half steps, which ruined a lot of things for us, divorced us from the natural ratios that uh, nature gave us. Uh, olfactory stimuli can cause also activities in the brain. This is Palo Santo um, being uh, smelled. Palo Santo is sacred wood that's used in uh, shamanic ceremonies in the Amazon. It's beautifully fragrant and aromatic. As you can see, the limbic system here is going off the chart. It causes the, the person to feel elated, vibrant, alive. Um, so, the vagus nerve is the most important nerve in the body. It starts um, in the base of the brain and it goes all the way down around the spine. Um, behind the lungs, um, around the intestines and, and um, the stomach, and uh, it's tremendously affected by uh, sound, by anything that's emotional, by plants. That's another thing that I would be talking about. Um, this is another slide, but the vagus nerve, I encourage you to read more about it. And. The autonomic nervous system is also uh, affected by sound. Uh, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. It's kind of like the on-off kind of thing. Um, so when we listen to music, we subconsciously are propelled to where we feel, we sense this therapeutic potential that music can have on us. Um, so it's important to understand uh, how sound affects us by using science and to pay attention to our experience, to the direct experience. Um, all of these things are tremendously helpful. What's also helpful is learning about uh, how to listen. This is something that I share with people I work with as a sound therapist. Um, technique to keep your awareness on the sound. Judiciously listen to the overtones. To become aware of the space between the overtones. Explore the different register of the overtones observe the varying modulation, the wobble, the beat that each overton has. Um, notice the varying dynamics, softness and loudness. Visualize opening yourself to the sound and merge with it. Contemplate the shifting energy of the overall sound and of the overtones. To allow oneself to be completely engrossed in sound to an extent where anything outside of that which you're observing would cease to exist. This is where you become the event and there's no more an awareness of the observer. 
going deep into the sound until you reach time stopping ecstasy. As you see, everything is centered around the meditative aspect. This is where you are letting go of the doorway of the everyday life, busyness, the mind, the chatter of the mind, and you're opening the gate to what's behind the scene, to the higher self, by allowing a greater level of presence, of equanimity, of attention, of awareness, to start to vibrate sympathetically with these instruments, to take you to where you need to go, to disconnect from old patterns, habitual patterns, to snap out of unhealthy baseline, to establish resonance. This is where healing is. It's in reinstating a state of resonance between mind, body, and heart. And this is very, very complex. I don't use it like others do freely and, and uh, you know, no, it's a very important thing to understand how personal resonance and what we can do to enhance the state is the most important thing in personal healing. Healing does not happen by magic. Self-healing has to take place. A healer is someone who gives way for all this to happen, to encourage the person to heal themselves, to, to promote use of tools, to support, to enhance the experience, to create a dialogue, to remind the person that they are their own healer. So we heal ourselves with sound. Sound can still have a powerful effect on us, but most of the healing is done with our awareness, with our participation. And uh, that's my presentation. Um, if you have any comments, uh, feel free to send me an email, uh, beyond asking now, of course. And feel free to check out my website, uh, soundmeditation.com. I have a lot of uh, information and a lot of things will be uh, uploaded at some point soon.